Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Asian stocks gain after the S&P 500 uh, climbs on bets of Federal Reserve rate cuts. We also turn to the US in politics in Chicago, the Democratic National Convention. We've been hearing from Joe Biden this morning. Selecting Kamala was the very first decision I made before I became, when I became our nominee. And it was the best decision I made my whole career. Plus, pressure on Hamas. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken urges the group to say yes after Israel accepts a Gaza ceasefire plan. A very good morning. Tuesday the 20th of August. Welcome to Daybreak Europe. We're looking at these markets pretty steady at the moment. Futures pointing higher on both sides of the Atlantic. But the highlight of the week that we continue to await will be Jerome Powell's speech at Jackson Hole on Friday. We're looking for clues as to the potential Fed path ahead. Traders really thirsty for these rate cuts. But yesterday the S&P managing to reclaim that 5,600 level. If we flip over to the cross-asset picture, you can see the 10-year US US Treasury yield is higher, a basis point at 3.8%. The yen is currently at a 146 handle, uh, so it has been reversing some of its earlier gains. But gold steady near a record high, floating around $2,500 per troy ounce, making a bar of gold about a cool million dollars at this point. And again, it comes back to the expectation of looser Fed policy, which comes back to the US demand story, which is what is feeding Brent. $77 a barrel, the weakness in demand outweighing the geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, and yesterday's drop the biggest in more than two weeks. But let's check in on Asia markets now. We've got Avril Hong on standby for us in Singapore. Avril, what's happening where you are? Yeah, Lizzie, I think it's that anticipation running really high that Powell on Friday at Jackson Hole is going to open the door to those cuts. And that is really what's fueling the risk appetite in the region. Asia's stock gauge headed for its third day of gains. And we're seeing even equities in Japan reversing the declines from a day ago and helping to offset the losses we're seeing on Chinese stocks. And that's getting the drag, the CSI 300, from the energy counters as they decline, tracking those declines we're seeing in Brent, no thanks to those demand concerns also weighing on the commodity. Now, we're seeing South Korea's cost be helped along by the tech and the financial names. Those are the ones that are really boosting the benchmark in South Korea. Added tailwind flipped the board in the form of what we're seeing on the Korean won. And this is something that our M Life strategist Mark Cranfield has highlighted the appreciation in the currency that can help to bring in these local uh, stock market inflows. So this is also a currency that's been benefiting from the risk appetite as the high beta currencies seem to be doing quite well against the backdrop of the confidence that we're going to see the Fed start those cuts. But coming into today, you already got the sense that the dollar bears were getting ahead of themselves. The dollar is now steadying and we're actually seeing a bit of the unwind of the past two sessions in terms of the climb in the yuan and the Japanese currency. Flip the board again because I wanted to highlight the sense of reprieve we're getting for Asia currencies as the Bloomberg Asia dollar index is hovering near its highest in seven months, headed for its best month in about a year in this year. So this is what we are seeing in terms of the FX as well as the state of play in equities. Lizzie. All right, Avril Hong in Singapore, we thank you for the update. And I want to get back to the Democratic National Convention out of Chicago now, the focus of the day, or one of them. We've got the outgoing US President Joe Biden defending his time in office in a passionate speech. He really underlined the credentials of Kamala Harris to be his successor at the White House. Take a listen. Selecting Kamala was the very first decision I made before I became, when I became our nominee. And it was the best decision I made my whole career. And she'll be a president our children can look up to. She'll be a president respected by world leaders because she already is. She'll be a president we can all be proud of. 
And she will be an historic president who puts her stamp on America's future. Bit more Bonnie Quinn's in Washington for us. She's been listening to every word of that speech. And Bonnie, I wonder what you're, you made of it. He's got to show he's still the president while passing the baton to Harris. It's a difficult balance to strike. It was, and he managed to do it. You heard some of it there. He tied Kamala Harris to all of his administration's achievements. So he talked about, you know, the, the, the least wide racial wealth gap in 20 years. He talked about the economy post-pandemic. He talked about infrastructure and his infrastructure bill. And he basically said that Kamala Harris had been very instrumental in all of these positive things that happened during his time in office. He does, of course, leave after this and take some time off, some vacation with his wife in California and allow Kamala Harris to fully embrace this DNC and be embraced by this DNC. But it definitely was a night where delegates got to thank Joe Biden, not just delegates, but also politicians, a cavalcade of senators and other speakers and the run up to Joe Biden. You see him there with his daughter, Ashley, an emotional moment as she handed over to him right before he took the podium. But he did manage to keep most of his speech, as you can see, you know, very non-emotional, if you like. He had that moment of emotion at the beginning, and after that it was a lengthy speech which touted the administration's achievements both at home and abroad. And in fact, he also mentioned some of the flashpoints that Donald Trump will be trying to hit Kamala Harris with, including the border. He basically said that Donald Trump was responsible for killing the bipartisan border bill that Kamala Harris has promised to bring back. And he also obviously spoke about the protesters out on the street, which was an unusual moment for Joe Biden. OK, so a gaffery speech exiting stage left, but we're going to hear from the Obamas later. We'll also get that ceremonial roll call vote. And it seems the influencers are descending on Chicago as well, Vonnie. What are you watching out for today in the city? Yes, there's a lot still to come. Remember, that was only night one. Um, obviously, it was Joe Biden's sort of big speech, but there are more big speeches to come. And of course, the DNC will want to keep this momentum going, not just the momentum they've had going into this DNC, but the momentum from night one. It is obviously the first in-person DNC in eight years. So you could see in the audience, people were really riled up and really fired up. And the DNC will want this bump that they get usually post post conventions to even be bigger and broader and for some of this joy and excitement to percolate out and maybe try and convince voters that are persuadable that haven't yet decided who they want to vote for that Kamala Harris is the person to vote for to that end Hillary Clinton spoke earlier tonight and talked about how Kamala Harris would break the glass ceiling when she takes the oath of office as the 47th president of the United States and again we have the Clintons later in the week Bill Clinton her husband will be speaking in two nights time in Tuesday night, we have the Obamas speaking. And of course, there's a whole array of celebrities as well that have been in attendance. You mentioned also the the influencers. There have been about 200, Lizzie, and actually some of them spoke on the stage the first time ever that that has happened at a Democratic National Convention or indeed any convention. The Kamala Harris Wolves ticket, really understanding how important it is to target that youth vote and doing so by allowing these influencers to come in and giving them permits and privileges and having them even, you know, videotape as this is going on. We had TikToks and Instagram lives and all sorts of things going out as the DNC was happening. Full disclosure, Bonnie, I still don't know what brat means, so we'll leave it there. Bonnie Quinn, thanks for joining us with the latest on the DNC. Let's get back to market, shall we? Safer territory. The S&P 500 posting its longest winning streak this year on bets that the Fed is going to signal it's ready to start cutting rates. Of course, this comes as central bankers diverge on rates ahead of the Jackson Hole meeting this week, where Jerome Powell's set to take centre stage. We can get more now from Bloomberg's M Live strategist Mark Cranfield. And Mark, let me ask you, just how divided are central bankers as we head to Jackson Hole? Well, it's not a, not a huge division, really. If you look at the way traders are pricing for interest rate cuts, it's, it's pretty much across the board in, in the G10 space. Of course, the obvious exception is Japan, where we still expect that there'll be a mm. little bit more in terms of increasing interest rates. But everybody else is going to be lowering rates, but at maybe at different speeds. That's probably what 
is causing a little bit of a headache for some investors is not everybody. We have seen in the past, there's been historical periods when pretty much all the G10 central bankers were cutting rates within the space of a few weeks of each other. That's not so much the case now. We've already seen New Zealand move, the Bank of England move, and the ECB, and yet we're waiting for the Federal Reserve. Typically, they're the one that leads the pack, but this time they're actually playing catch up to some degree. And then from here, it's really a question of modifying people's expectations, where Jerome Powell this week has got a tough job. He's got to persuade traders that he can cut rates, but at his own pace, where the market is already pricing for a lot more than he probably wants to give away. And then we're going to hear after that from people like the ECB and the Bank of England, who also will be under pressure to extend their rate cuts. But again, they'll want to temper it with the fact that their inflation numbers are not coming down as quickly as they would like. So you're, what you're going to get is a question of, are traders going to be satisfied with a different pace of interest rate cuts? And we'll get a much better idea after everyone has spoken this weekend. We are on the ECB. We've heard from the Finnish central bank chief, Olli Ren, saying that Europe's growth risks bolster the case to cut next time in September. Do you expect September to be one of the two rate cuts traders are pricing for the rest of the year? I think if you look at the way the market has responded since the first interest rate cut from the, Federal, from the European Central Bank and from the way Christine Lagarde has guided the narrative, it will be surprising if the ECP doesn't deliver another cut in September. And, and central bankers know it's dangerous not to give the markets. You need to give the markets some of what they're expecting, particularly if it's been there for a long period, which it has been in terms of traders expecting a rate cut in September. Now, beyond there, the story becomes a lot more difficult. There, there seems to be a divide between, and not surprised, you've got 28 members on the European Central Bank Council. There's always differing opinions, but they do seem to be publicly at odds with each other as to how much more we can do after September. And that's partly why the market is not pricing as aggressively for the ECB as they have been for the Federal Reserve. So once again, we'll get to September. Christine Lagarde will have a tough job. She'll need to manage expectations. And let's see how dovish she is at the press conference in in September. That will give us a guidance as to how much more we can expect. And it may well be that she'll try and dissuade investors that they've really done enough this year and they'd like to see inflation come down quite a bit more. It's still around 2.6, which is a bit high in terms of lowering interest rates one month after another. So she'll probably ask for a period of consolidation. Whether the markets give it to her, that's a much different question. Well, yeah, that definitely seems like she learned the lesson of being overly dovish in the first half of the year. I'm live strategist Mark Cranfield. We thank you for that look ahead. Let's look ahead at what's coming up today on the docket. At 8.30 a.m. London time, we get a decision from the Riksbank, the Swedish central bank expected to resume its easing cycle and cut rates a quarter point to 3.5%. So do keep an eye on the krona. We'll bring you a preview later in the show. At 10 a.m. London time, we get euro area CPI, of course, feeding into that ECB decision that we were discussing with Mark Cranfield. At 12 p.m. London time, it's the turn of the Central Bank of Turkey, expected to hold the one-week repo rate at 50% for the fifth straight meeting, though tightening through alternative tools. And elsewhere today, we'll hear from the Fed's Raphael Bosick and Michael Barr ahead of Jerome Powell's Jackson Hole speech on Friday. Coming up on this programme, Anthony Blinken says Israel has accepted a ceasefire proposal and Hamas must now do the same. We'll bring you more from the US Secretary of State's visit to Israel next. Plus, Vladimir Zelensky urges Ukraine's allies to lift restrictions on their use, the use of weapons uh, to strike inside Russia. We'll have the latest on the geopolitical situation next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. To geopolitics now, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken says Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has accepted a ceasefire deal and it's now up to Hamas to say yes. It puts the onus on the militant group to end the 10-month war, even as the violence continues. Blinken's called the deal a bridging agreement, acknowledging that not everything is spelt out in detail. But we can get more details now with Bloomberg's Abir Abu Omar. Abir, what's the latest we're hearing on these ceasefire talks? Hi, Lizzie. So, yes, I mean... 
Antony Blinken has been doing uh, a regional visit uh, to the Middle East over the past couple of days. Uh, this is his ninth visit since October 7th, and he was in Israel yesterday, where, as you mentioned uh, correctly, uh, he said that uh, Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, has agreed to a ceasefire deal. Now, granted, this doesn't encompass everything that was suggested in uh, President uh, Joe Biden's uh, plan in May to return all the hostages. We don't know the exact details of, the, of that yet. But again, as you suggested, it is a bridging agreement. It's now up to Hamas to agree to those terms and hopefully end the you know war that's been killing tens of thousands of people in Gaza and that has killed uh, thousands of people in Israel since uh, October 7th. And we know that uh, the last talks that happened in Doha, Hamas did not attend. We know that Israeli negotiators met with uh, mediators from the Arab world and the U.S. Uh, to sort of reach uh, the, the, the ceasefire agreement. Uh, but we know that the mediators have conveyed uh, Israel's demands to Hamas. So it's now really up to Hamas what Hamas decides and uh, whether they do, in fact, agree to the terms of this latest agreement. Well, from a market's perspective, oil traders have been waiting so long for a ceasefire deal, but also for an Iranian retaliation, that now they're focusing on the demand story out of the US and China. What's the latest on whether Iran is going to strike? So this is an interesting part, right? Yesterday, as we were reporting this story, Iran said that they do welcome the terms of reaching a ceasefire agreement, but that a retaliation is still on the books. So we're still expecting a retaliation to happen. We don't know when, we don't know how. This, of course, Lizzie is, um, you know, taking revenge for the killing of Ismail Haniyeh uh, by the end of July uh, in Iran, an attack that Israel never took responsibility for. So our understanding is, you know, a retaliation is still very much a, a prospect, but we know that Antony Blinken is going to visit Qatar and Egypt to speak with uh, officials there to understand from them what is in the heads of Hamas leaders. And so we're following the story, and by the end of this week, hopefully we get some more uh, light about what you know what has been reached, what Hamas agreed on, if the deal is actually going to be uh, agreed upon. Uh, hopefully. So a strike very much still on the table. Abir Abu Omar, we thank you for the update on the Middle East situation. And we can turn now to the geopolitical situation of Ukraine, where Vladimir Zelensky has urged allies to lift restrictions on the use of their weapons to strike inside Russia. It comes, of course, as Kyiv continues its two-week incursion into the Kursk region. And we can get now from Bloomberg's more from T Bloomberg's Tony Halpin. Tony, just give us the latest developments on Ukraine's incursion into Russia. I wonder whether analysts see Zelensky's strategy of creating this buffer zone as likely to be effective. Uh, morning, Lizzie. Yes, well, um, President Zelensky was in pretty bullish mood when he addressed Ukrainian ambassadors yesterday. Uh, Ukrainian forces apparently now control something close to 500 square miles of Russian territory inside that border Kursk region. Uh, President Zelensky said that they succeeded in pushing back Russian forces who were threatening communities inside northern Ukraine, and that that was the whole point of this uh, incursion, that they wanted to demonstrate, first of all, that they could uh, uh, effectively, by going on attack, improve their defence, but also to demonstrate to the wider world that, as he called it, the illusions about Russia's red lines were being exposed, and that this bolstered his argument for Ukraine to have restrictions lifted on long-range weapons so that they could take the fight more clearly to Russia and against uh, airfields in particular that are used to attack Ukrainian cities. Interesting to see Germany pushing back against the weekend report that it won't provide additional aid to Ukraine, Tony. We saw shares in German defence stocks like Rheinmetall falling yesterday. Do you think there's any connection to Kyiv's surprise incursion here? Well, I think it was a bit of a public embarrassment for, for Germany that people interpreted this as somehow they were cutting support for Ukraine when in fact their case was that they were uh, limiting the amount of new support that they were going to give to Ukraine that wasn't already in the budget. So there was a, a, a scramble, I think, to, to clarify that message and, and cl clearly Kiev will be keen to ensure that they do maintain support for, for Ukraine because Germany is a very important partner for Kiev it's the second largest after the US in the supply of military aid. And what Kiev wants to demonstrate is that as they're on the attack, as they're succeeding in pushing Russia back, they need uh, support from their allies to increase, to raise the pressure on Russia's Vladimir Putin in order to bring him to the table and to bring about a settlement of this war.
All right, Bloomberg's Tony Halp, and we thank you for the update. We also have the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi set to visit Kiev on Friday, but he's ruled out a role mediating an end to the war. We'll keep across that visit for you. Coming up on this programme, Africa's biggest wireless carrier reports its first loss since 2016. We'll bring you some of our interview with the CEO of South Africa's MTN Group. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now, the World Health Organization says Burundi has reported 100 cases of MPOX caused by a fast-spreading subvariant that's triggered an outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The cases, 28% of which were in children under five, have been reported since July in multiple districts. Cases have also been reported in nearby Kenya, Uganda and Rwanda. Well, let's stay in Africa now, but to corporate news, where the biggest wireless carrier, MTN, has posted its first loss since 2016 after the devaluation of the Nigerian Naira crimped income from one of its key markets. The CEO told us he expects pressure on the currency to soften as inflation slows in Africa's biggest economy. The Naira ended last year at 907 versus the US dollar. In this half, it's average 1500, so quite a lot of volatility. But between Q2 and even up to now, the Naira has been actually fairly stable. Um, and on you know, more recent forecast, uh, if I use Standard Bank Group Securities forecast, um, you know, the pressure on the Naira is, um, is um, projected to abate somewhat as inflation expectations are that uh, inflation in Nigeria should start to come down um, and that rate tightening cycle in Nigeria will remain and therefore take pressure off uh, the Naira, you know, going forward. So that was the MTN CEO, Ralph Mapita, on the company's latest results. And for more on this, we can go to our chief Africa correspondent, Jennifer Sabasaja, who brought us that interview. Jen, the CEO seeming pretty hopeful on South Africa. Right, Lizzie, and I think it's important to note this because uh, South Africa is the home market for MTN. Uh, so what we did hear from Ralph Mupita, excuse me, during that interview is he said the results from MTN South Africa were decent, uh, but he still sees some scope for even more growth contribution uh, from the country and from the market here. So in particular, if we take a look at their contribution in the first half, uh, subscriber numbers grew 4.7 percent, reaching 38.5 million at the end of June. We also did see revenue jump by 59.1 percent. And part of that, uh, they noted, is because of airtime advance fees. But we also saw partnerships with MTN uh, and Showmax, uh, English Premier League, and also Disney Plus. So that potentially helping the subscriber numbers here uh, in mm -hmm. its home market. But still, as Ralph pointed out there, uh, a lot of their other markets have been challenging, namely Nigeria. So still uh, a number of headwinds they're facing uh, in the near term. OK, great interview. MTN looking to exit more markets, we hear. Jennifer Sabasaja, our chief Africa correspondent, we thank you for bringing it to us. We're going to go to U.S. politics next. The DNC continues in Chicago. But what's Donald Trump up to this week? He's been defending his blast at the Fed, claiming he shouldn't be blocked from speaking freely. We'll get you some analysis on those comments on his Bloomberg interview next as we look at futures pointing ever so slightly higher stateside as well as in Europe. Do stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Lizzie Verdon in Dubai, and these are the stories that set your agenda. Asian stocks gain after the S&P 500 powers to its longest winning streak this year. On bets the Fed will soon signal it's ready to cut rates. President Joe Biden calls on Democrats to rally behind Kamala Harris as his party's convention kicks off in Chicago. It was the very first decision I made before I became, when I became our nominee. 
and it was the best decision I made my whole career. Thus, pressure on Hamas. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken urges the group to say yes after Israel accepts a Gaza ceasefire plan. Well, those are our top stories. Welcome to Tuesday, the 20th of August. You're looking at futures pretty flat on both sides of the Atlantic this morning. The S&P managing to reclaim that 5,600 level at the end of yesterday's session, so logging its longest winning streak this year. But if we flip the board over to the cross-asset picture, you've got the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield higher a basis point at 3.8%. Currently, the yen uh, now at 147 per dollar. Gold steady near a record high, really taking in those expectations of looser Fed policy. It's now about a million dollars a bar for gold. And just Brent there as well. $77 a barrel is where we trade. Weaker eight-tenths of percent as the demand weakness story out of China and the US really outweighs the geopolitical tensions in the Middle East. But let's return now to the US election because Donald Trump has downplayed criticism that he's undercut the Fed. He has been saying that he should be able to to speak freely when it comes to monetary policy. Let's get back to Bloomberg's Bonnie Quinn. She's in Washington. She's been monitoring the DNC and analysing these comments for Donald Trump. Bonnie, he made them to Bloomberg and he's now downplaying the criticism that he's undercut Jay Powell's autonomy. Yes, his argument, Lizzie, is essentially that he was jawboning and he jawboned with the Fed chair during his term in office, but that doesn't necessarily mean it had an effect on any kind of decision that the Fed chair might have made. So essentially he is downplaying the fact that he would like to have a little bit more of a role in monetary policy perhaps than other politicians who tend to be a little bit hands-off, uh, totally hands-off in fact, and the Fed chair himself and previously Janet Yellen herself and all of the Fed chairs previous to that have always said, look, this is an independent role. We don't take any advice from politicians. We do what the economy needs needs us to do. But it is an interesting little glimpse into what might be the future if Donald Trump were to be elected president. He had said, of course, in the past that he wouldn't want Jerome Powell to continue on as Fed chair after his current term expires. You know, free to change his mind and so on. But he said when he was asked who he would like to be as next Fed chair, you know, he said it was way too early to tell. So he's equivocating a little bit, but he's also suggesting that he has a good instinct when it comes to monetary policy. And so I suppose these interviews are just one attempt from Donald Trump to try and steal the limelight from Chicago this week. What else is he going to be up to later on? Yeah, it's true, Lizzie. I mean, all week long, he has interviews, news conferences and events in swing states planned. And it's all in an effort to take away some of the oxygen from the DNC, which is really like a helium balloon right now. You have all of the delegates, you know, close to 5,000 delegates in the United Center in Chicago, just completely riled up, having just heard from Joe Biden a couple of hours ago, basically what he will be saying on the campaign trail as he accompanies Kamala Harris, but also sort of a goodbye and a sort of a, an acknowledgement of everything that he had done in office, a thank you to them, and also they were thanking him. It was a, quite an emotional scene for a few minutes there in the United Center. But yes, so, so Donald Trump continues to plan. He was going to be in Michigan on Tuesday and continues his red state tour with North Carolina Wednesday, very important states. And in fact, Kamala Harris in the latest polling is leading marginally in North Carolina. Donald Trump doesn't want that direction to continue and obviously post DNC there will be a bump as is typical for the Democrats presumably this year will be no different and then Thursday he ends the week at the border this is the day of course that Kamala Harris officially accepts the nomination he is going to be in Arizona he is going to point out that Kamala Harris has been pretty much deficient on border issues. You saw the president, Joe Biden, get in front of that tonight when he said that Donald Trump had killed the bipartisan border bill, which was about to pass, and that he had called people up and essentially said, don't vote for this, this will make me look weak, and will make Kamala Harris look weak as well. All right, Vonnie Quinn, we thank you for that analysis of the U.S. politics this week. Plenty to watch with the DNC in Chicago. But let's get to Europe now. TSMC building an $11 billion plant in eastern Germany. This is in partnership with several other European chip makers. And we can get the details from Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, who's in Berlin for us. Oli, how big is this project and why did it end up in Germany? 
Yeah, Lizzie, listen, it's a huge project. As you say, 10 billion euros is really significant. And for TSMC, it's also specifically very significant. But let's get down into actually what this is going to do. It's going to build wafers within Germany, within Dresden. And this is obviously a massive sort of strategic uh, venture for the German government and others. So TSMC has basically said, uh, yes, we're willing to come to Europe for the very first time and build this fab here. It'll cost 10 billion euros. What's interesting is that you're also going to have a partnership with some of the other local companies, including Infineon, a German German company, NXP, Bosch, obviously they're each getting a 10% stake, but TSMC is holding on to 70% stake of this project. We should also say of the 10 billion, 5 billion is coming directly from the German government in the form of a subsidy. And this is really important for the Germany for a number of reasons, not least of which um, they're going to be building trip, uh, chips for the industrial sector and of course the automotive sector. For TSMC, it's part of their global expansion. They opened their first fab this year um, over in Japan. They have huge expansion plans over in Arizona and the United States are spending 65 billion euros or dollars, I should say, um, in that expansion. And it's also relevant for the EU, right, Lizzie? Uh, Ursula von der Leyen and the Commission, they want to build 20% of the world's chips in the next six years. That seems, frankly, almost impossible, but you need projects like these in order to get any sort of chip and semiconductor-based production within Europe. Yeah, so in the context of the global chip race, where does Germany sit right now? Where does it want to be? Yeah, Lizzie, what's really interesting is that, you know, sort of, I think Germany is waking up to kind of the questions about what the future of its economy is, right? We've talked about this a lot on Bloomberg Television. We've talked about this a lot about basically Germany having dominated so many industries for the sort of past decades. The question is, what does this actually look like going forward? And one of the ways that they want to sort of lay a stake on is the semiconductors. That is why they're giving out, they've given out already more than 15 billion uh, euros worth of subsidies to a number of uh, projects, including this one, but also also one from Intel. What's also interesting, Lizzie, is that in order to do that, you need to build an ecosystem, right? You need to have a sort of Silicon Valley. What Germany has, what they call, is Silicon Saxony, which is where Dresden is already. That's where Infineon is, where they have a number of chip production uh, going on over there. But what's really important is you need certain things to build these chips, right? You need very, for example, very consistent electricity and power supply, because if there's any blip in that, that ruins the sort of uh, the chips that you're building. But more importantly, Lizzie, is you need the ecosystem in terms of the labor force. You need people that can actually work these jobs, have the expertise. You have a number of universities around Dresden that are really good in electrical engineering, but you need the companies and the jobs to build it out. So that's why it's so important for a company like TSMC to come to a place where you already have this sort of stuff. Um, and obviously, you're also feeding the auto sector. So it's important to have that dialogue with industry as well. Silicon Saxony, I like it. But of course, Ollie, there are also concerns in the world of semiconductors right now. How could that bear on this plan? Yeah, so listen, not everyone in the EU is really thrilled about the degree of subsidies that Germany is throwing at these projects. Obviously, Germany has a lot more fiscal firepower than a lot of other um, European countries, so that's sort of one of the snags. There's also a lot of questions around sort of culture clash. We've talked about this, and there's been a lot of reporting about it um, in terms of TSMC, a Taiwanese company coming to Arizona, where you have really very different ways of doing business, and there's been a bit of clash there. There's some concern around that um, coming here to Germany, where the unions are very, very powerful. The kind of way that people work is very different than it is um, in Taiwan. And then there's also the question of, you know, this is an industry that gets disrupted um, semi-easily uh, only because there's so much happening at once. I mean, we just saw it out of Intel a couple of weeks ago. They're cutting 15,000 jobs. Um, they've had their worst drop on the stock in 40 years because of, you know, things that are sh changing up and they may perhaps not terribly well positioned for the sort of AI future of chips. The question is for many of these companies is, and particularly for Intel, is that they've got received 10 billion euros from the German government to build their own plant in another part of Germany. There has been a lot of silence around that, Lizzie. And could there be a delay to that project? We know that uh, Intel is delaying some of their projects in Ohio. So these are the kinds of risks going forward. You can throw as much money as you want to at it, but these companies really need to be able to show up. OK, Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, great reporting. We thank you for it. And we're going to travel along the supply chain now from semiconductors to electric vehicles. It really is a big week for Asia earnings. China automaker Xpeng reporting today, followed tomorrow by Xili and Xiaomi as well. The higher vehicle sales expected, though uh, competition really heating up and those EU tariffs, as Ollie talked about, on the way as well. Let's get more now from our Asia transport reporter, Linda Liu. She joins us now from Hong Kong. Linda, what should investors be watching out for with this slew of results? 
So with Xpeng coming up uh, later today, we're, also, we're expecting another quarter of losses um, because it hasn't been able to turn a profit uh, since it was founded with um, its partnership with Volkswagen, uh, where it's buying technology from Xpeng. That's expected to be the earnings driver. And then looking ahead to Geely, um, they've been growing their sales uh, at a really fast pace. So we're looking to see a really healthy revenues, hopefully translating into profits. Its margin is also uh, expected to improve in the second quarter, up from uh, the first quarter where it saw its gross margin at about 13.7. So probably looking at about 15% for the second quarter. And uh, lastly, Xiaomi, uh, everyone is very excited about how uh, Brisk has been able to deliver its uh, EVs. It's clocking in at about 10,000 units uh, monthly now. So it's said that it's able to achieve its annual goal for 100,000 EV deliveries this year ahead of time uh, to be achieved in November. So uh, we're expecting Xiaomi sales to increase at about 30% and we'll see how that translates into the bottom line. And of course, geopolitical tensions, including those EU provisional tariffs, are already weighing on Chinese EV exporters. I wonder how big of an impact it is if you put it in context for us, Linda. Yeah, looking at the impact from EU tariffs, we're already seeing Chinese EV exports to Europe in July taking a hit. Uh, it's dropped from a really fast growth in June. So uh, one month after the tariffs coming into effect in July, uh, exports have already taken a hit. You've got uh, automakers like Geely, which is going to feel the tariff pain across its uh, big portfolio brands. You know, it controls Volvo, Polestar. So these brands have already said they're looking to move production elsewhere, especially with Volvo probably moving the production of one of its electric SUVs uh, to Belgium. So with that, uh, the short term uh, before it moves its uh, production, we're watching out for how it's going to manage its impact, whether by pricing adjustments or other methods. And uh, one of other uh, Geely's other brands uh, called Zika has also said it's scouting out locations in Europe to um, find a, a better production sites for its products. All right, Asia Transport reporter Linda Liu, we thank you for that preview of those earnings from Xpeng, Geely and Xiaomi. And we're going to stay in Asia now, where uh, the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia has long had a reputation as a centre for illicit drug making and trafficking as well. But law enforcement agencies say that the illegal activity is now thriving in a special economic zone where the borders of Laos, Myanmar and Thailand meet. Bloomberg Originals has been looking into just how a Chinese businessman is now seen as the de facto ruler of this remote region. Here's a preview. The Golden Triangle Special Economic Zone is an enormous center for criminal activity of all kinds. Drug trafficking, human trafficking, and scam operations. Victims have been mostly deceived by online ads promising career opportunities abroad with good pay. They keep my passport when I arrive in the last land. After that, they teach me how to become a scammer. I work here, this building. One man allegedly controls this transnational crime hub, Chinese national Zhao Wei. Zhao Wei is in charge. He sets the rules. And Chinese organized crime groups have become some of the most powerful criminal networks, both in Southeast Asia and beyond. Laos is a communist country with close ties to the Chinese Communist Party. So China has dramatically more influence in Laos than, say, the United States. The big question here is whether China eventually decides they want to put a stop to this or not. One of the mysteries here is China's attitude to Zhao Wei. They seem to be overall somewhat tolerant of him. So who is Zhao Wei and why is an alleged crime boss allowed to run this place like his personal kingdom?
Subscribers can watch that report in full right now on the terminal or at Bloomberg.com and it'll be on Bloomberg Originals YouTube channel later on. Don't miss it. Let's also take a look at some of the events we're following for you today. At 10 a.m. London time, we'll get those euro area CPI numbers, crucial, of course, for the European Central Bank. Then at 12 p.m. London time, we'll have a decision from the Turkish Central Bank. They're expected to hold the one-week repo rate at 50% for a fifth straight meeting. Then before the U.S. market open, we get earnings from Lowe's. Revenues forecast to be $23.9 billion, which would indicate a 4.1% decline from a year ago, the same quarter. It is, of course, the second day of the Democratic National Convention. We'll keep across that for you. And we have the Fed's Raphael Bostic and uh, Barr speaking as well, laying the groundwork really for Jay Powell's speech at Jackson Hole on Friday. But coming up to another central bank, Sweden's Riksbank under pressure to turn around its ailing economy. We'll look ahead to the crucial rate decision today. So stay with us for that. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Now to some other stories making news this morning. British tycoon Mike Lynch is among those missing after a luxury yacht was struck by a tornado and sank off the coast of Sicily. Lynch's wife is among those who have already been rescued, but at least one person is dead and six others missing after the boat sank early yesterday. Sources say that the couple were celebrating follow Lynch's, following Lynch's recent acquittal from US fraud charges. In other news, Carl Icahn and his firm will pay $2 million to settle with the SEC over a margin loans probe. It caps a 15-month period that saw the investor's net worth plummet by $19 billion. Shares of Icahn Enterprises fell 4.7% following the news of the settlement over allegations that Icahn didn't prove enough provide enough information about how he was borrowing against his stake in the company. And elsewhere, AMD shares surged in New York after the company announced it's buying server maker ZT Systems. The cash and stock transaction values the deal at nearly $5 billion. ZT has extensive experience making server computers for owners of large data centers. The takeover boosts AMD's efforts to challenge NVIDIA, which has been the runaway leader in the market. Now to central banks. A speculation mounts that Jerome Powell will roll the pitch for a September rate cut when he speaks at Jackson Hole on Friday. Today, the Swedish Riksbank is likely to resume its own rate cutting cycle. Bloomberg's Nordic economy and government editor Oit Umelos joins me now from Oslo in Norway. Oit, a rate cut today. Is it a done deal? Could it be a half point move perhaps? Uh, indeed, if you look at uh, the economists uh, surveyed by Bloomberg, uh, everyone is expecting uh, um, a quarter point cut and uh, um, any other um, outcome would be a surprise. Uh, and lately, we've had pressure growing domestically um, from observers and trade groups uh, for an even bigger cut. And that all comes down to the state of the Swedish economy right now. Uh, I mean, the latest data has been uh, rather weak, uh, with a few exceptions. Uh, we've had some manufacturing activity uh, going into contractionary territory in July. We've had the flat estimate for GDP uh, showing second quarter could uh, well have been a contraction. Um, and uh, on the consumption side, um, we, we do have a slightly better outlook for consumers, but the data itself is, is pretty weak. So all in all, um, the figures show that the recovery isn't really there yet. And, and if you couple that with the latest inflation figures, uh, which show um, those are uh, under uh, the Riks Bank's forecast for the last two months, uh, that basically tells you why why there's more pressure now for the Riks Bank to cut, uh, possibly even by uh, half a point. Well, Oi, given that weakness in the economy, given the accusation that the Riks Bank was behind the curve into the crisis in 2022, do you think that further out it could accelerate the plan to cut rates? Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's a fair guess. Uh, yes, there historically uh, the Riksbank has been um, sort of burnt uh, 
uh, but uh, also there's uh, the uh, currency aspect. Um, uh, I mean, for the last uh, few years, uh, the corona has been uh, the corona weakness has been an issue for uh, the policymakers in Sweden, and um, um, they will definitely be uh, still very of uh, uh, of uh, you know not uh, contributing too much to the corona weakness, which could uh, then feed uh, foreign inflation. Okay, we'll keep an eye on the corona. Bloomberg Nordic Economy and Government Editor Oit Umelis, we thank you for that preview. We've got plenty more still ahead on the show, so do stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. It's five to seven. And just as we get to the end of the program, I want to leave you with three charts. The first shows the S&P's rally into the close yesterday, reclaiming that 5,600 level. Futures are pointing ever so slightly higher today. So could it go even further? It's been logging its longest winning streak so far this year. Looks set to continue. But if we flip the board, we can see partly what's fueling this rally. It's the expectation of Fed cuts. Hopefully we'll get more clarity on their pace when we hear from Jay Powell at Jackson Hole on Friday, though I wouldn't hold your breath. This is a delicate needle for him to thread, of course, when it comes to a communications perspective. And finally, if we flip the board again, you can see that that same narrative is propelling the US towards rate cuts, and it's also weighing on oil. The lacklustre demand in the US and China outweighing the geopolitical tensions and knocking oil the most in more than two weeks. So Brent currently trading at $77 a barrel as we continue to await a ceasefire deal, as we continue to await a retaliation from Iran. Israel not claiming responsibility for that strike, but as we heard from Abu Abir Abu Omar, that strike still very much on the table. That does it for Daybreak Europe. I've been Lizzie Burden in Dubai. I'm going to hand you over to Guy Johnson and Kriti Gupta in London next. They'll bring you the opening trade as we look to futures in Europe on the stocks 50 higher a tenth of 8%. Thanks for joining us. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>